Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to see you here, particularly on a day like today with this rain, and it really indicates that you care about our airport, which is our front door to the St. Louis region. My name is Lorna Godwin of Vector Communications, and we are working with WSP on this project as the public engagement consultant. So again, thank you for being here this afternoon. We have a presentation for you that will basically go through the boards and, and what some of what you've heard already. The key word to remember this afternoon is preliminary. What's the key word? Preliminary. preliminary. <laughs> but this is a preliminary plan. An airport layout plan slash master plan. Preliminary. Nothing will be built tomorrow or within the next year. We got some time for that. But we have to get the planning done because the planning builds the foundation for uh, any building that we do. So thank you for being here. And the order of the evening is we will hear next from our airport manager, Rhonda Ham Newbrigi, and then we will hear from WSP's project manager, John Van Wansel. And then we will take Q&A. And I will bring the microphone to you, so if you have a question, you can feel free to ask it. Sound good? That will work for us. Again, thank you for being here. And now, Rhonda Han Newbrigi. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. And again, uh, my compliments for coming out this evening to hear the presentation. I think for the airport and for all of our team here, and there's many of our team members here tonight, you know, these working on these master plans takes a lot of work. We've been working on this master plan for a little over two years with our partner, WSP. It's a requirement of the FAA. We don't embark on these things because we want to. We're required to and a master plan, and you'll hear a lot more about it, but it's really from the FAA's perspective to look at your existing airport, your facilities, your runway system, to look at future needs, to look at what needs to be done from a planning perspective. And so as we got into this, clearly there were a lot of things that have been identified as we think about the future of our airport. You know, for those who know me, I've been involved with this airport for a long, long time. And I'm very passionate about it. I think it is an incredible asset for this region. And so when I think about what the future holds for it and where we need to go, I think it's critically important that we talk to all of you and we talk to the public about what, what are we thinking? Uh, what are your thoughts? Does this make sense? Does it not? Obviously with our airline partners, we, we, we also have to have them on board. So this is, as Lerner uh, said, and you'll hear it repeated, this is a preliminary plan. This is not something that's been signed off on. This is not something that's being built tomorrow. This is showing you and sharing with you what this master plan has identified and some of the challenges we'll face for the future if we continue to try and maintain a facility uh, that was built in 1956. So we're gonna, you're gonna hear a lot this evening. We want you to ask questions at the end. That's critically important to us. As we think about aviation right now and, and coming off of two years of the pandemic, which we all know was very challenging, we actually, for both uh, March and April, uh, came close to 90% of our 2019 pre-pandemic numbers. And we had a really strong 2019. We came in at almost 16 million people. Uh, and so we were on a trajectory that has seen a lot of growth in the last five years. Obviously, we all in this room probably remember days 30 years ago, um, but we have to look to the future and think about what this growth is for the future. So we've been very pleased coming off the pandemic with what we're seeing in terms of the, the passenger activity. Hopefully everybody's heard that we've got Lufthansa starting nonstop service uh, June 1st uh, to Germany this year. That's a big deal. It's the first time in 20 years we'll have Continental Europe service nonstop out of here. So we are really moving with all of our partners at the airport. Southwest is growing that connecting traffic. That's critically important to this region because as they grow that connecting traffic, it brings more flights for our local community. So we've got the ultra low cost carriers now like Spirit, uh, which came new during the pandemic. And we've got Frontier. Those bring new customers to the table. It's an opportunity for people who thought that flying might be out of reach for them or their families. So we have the ultra low cost carriers, we've got our legacy carriers like American Delta, United, Alaska, Air Canada, and then we've got Southwest, our strongest partner who is growing and who has that connecting traffic, which is such a big piece of our future. 
So when we think about the future, we're on a good trajectory. And we believe that while this year we'll still be a little shy of 2019, we actually think in 2023 we'll exceed that 16 million. So I think when you hear this tonight and you, you hear about this master plan and some of the things that we're looking at, think about where we take this airport for the future. Think about the asset it is to the region. Think about what it means to all of you and give us that feedback. And hopefully as we go through this process, if we embark on it, and it's a long process, um, you're not gonna see, you know, even if we move forward, this isn't something that happens in two years. So it's a long process. But along the way, uh, we want to be with our region and with all the people in this community who use this airport and who this airport serves. So that's critically important to myself, to the team here, to our mayor and the city, and I think all the surrounding communities, just about what, what does it mean for everything and everybody that is around this airport. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. John's with WSP. He's been our partner for a little over two years now, leading this project along with a great team as well. They've been an incredible partner with us, and I think he'll give you a, a bigger understanding of all the things that this master plan has identified, and then he and I both will be able to answer questions at the end, and certainly you can take some time if you haven't already. Uh, we'll have staff members spread throughout the room that can talk to the various uh, posters that are up. So thank you again for joining us, and I'll turn it over to John. So we've said plan and preliminary plan a couple times. I wanted to just talk a little bit about what that, what that means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, Rhonda mentioned this is required by the FAA. Last plan was done about 10 years ago. Uh, one of the benefits of that is that the FAA pays for major infrastructure projects at airports. And so when you do these plans, keep them current, that allows you to continue to receive money from FAA for, for airfield and other projects. So that's a major uh, benefit I'm going to have to put this on because I can't read anything anymore. Uh, the horizon of, of the plan is about 20 years, so we're, we're looking out 20 years, not that we know exactly what's going to happen, but a little bit more about what, how, what we do about this 20-year time frame. So it's a pretty long-term look. Um, the other key thing is it requires um, public input, so that's part of what, what we're doing tonight. We have a little bit more information on that. We've done surveys and other things to get input from people. It's not just a technical analysis we do in the proverbial smoky back room and come out with an answer. We want input and, and tweak the plan accordingly. Um, so what a, what a plan is not, as Rhonda was uh, summarizing, is, is, is the okay to go ahead with construction. You can't build anything with, you have, even if you have an approved master plan. There's multiple steps. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later as well. So this is the master plan uh, process. Uh, the red dot is where we are now. And you can see there's sort of three phases in a master plan. The first phase is you look at what's here today and how is it working. You look at what might it look like in 20 years? What's the growth that you're going to have to accommodate in 20 years? And then what are the shortfalls? So what are you short? Gates, space, whatever it might be. The next phase, and we are at the end of that phase now, is where you look at potential solutions. We call them alternatives. You know, what if we did this? What if we did that? Lots of different ideas and options were considered and ultimately end up with a preferred option, and that's kind of where we are now. And that's why we want your input on that option before it becomes final. And then once. Um, we do that, next phase is, okay, let's refine this. Let's sort out the details. How would you phase this? Exactly what might it cost? Uh, the environmental impact, are there any? Uh, and what is required next? Because after this is done, there will have to be environmental review as well. We'll look at financial feasibility more. That's key. It has to be financially feasible or it's just a nice picture. So that's all part of what we'll be doing between now and the end of the plan. Uh, next, we mentioned outreach. This is a bit of a summary. We have more information on that one of our stations. You see this uh, gray box is largest. That's because that's a specific committee we formed for the study, or you can call it ad hoc committee. We invited uh, 40 different organizations to join us. So that's everything from airlines, rental car agencies, concessionaires, to um, neighboring communities, chambers of commerce, economic development organizations, community groups like that, mayors, the county, so a pretty broad uh, range of people. We've met with them three times. They've given us all kinds of questions and input along the way, so that's been very good. We've done a number of surveys. It's in the small print there on the side, but again, we have more information on this. We've done three surveys, and we've gotten about close to 3,000 responses, so lots of input. A lot of people also took the time to write in comments, which we've organized and analyzed, and those are all 
part of the record as we move forward to see what people want in, the, in their airport moving forward. We've also met with the separate boxes there. Of course, we always talk to FAA and, and MoDOT. MoDOT has jurisdiction over the highway right in front of the airport. They are also looking at uh, updating their highway plan for the long term. Perfect timing. Let's talk together and see what we need to do with the roads, what they're doing. Do it at the same time. Perfect timing. Uh, FAA has been involved throughout different branches of the FAA. Uh, the public, that's what we're doing tonight, and the surveys, of course. Um, we've talked to the airlines. The airlines pay most of the bills at an airport, so they need to be on board with what you're doing or it's not going to go anywhere, so we've been briefing them along the way. Um, and then lastly, uh, it's hard to read, but the commission is the city's oversight body over the airport, so we've briefed them as well. And if you saw any press back in January about the plan, that's because we briefed them on generally where we were going and that we, we, we would be doing this. And the press was there, and so that got some coverage at the time. So if you read anything about the airport back in January, it's probably because of, uh, because of that. So let's talk a little bit about why plan for improvements other than the FAA wants you to do a plan. Um, aviation is interesting in that it is always changing. And of course, the airlines can, can turn on a dime what they're doing. They can add a route, drop a route, park their aircraft in the desert overnight. Airports have a lot of infrastructure, and it's much harder to respond with a big building than it is uh, with an airline that can, again, turn on a dime. So airline, it's a very interesting industry. There's always changes. Uh, when you look at the age of this, this facility was built later, but the domes you came in through, those were built in 56. So that's seven years before the arch. Uh, it's been kept up really well. The roof's new. I mean, it's in great shape. Structurally, it's fine. The domes are actually the best part uh, of the facility. Some of these facilities, as Ron mentioned, this was a former uh, regional jet concourse, and it just doesn't work anymore with today's aircraft. I mean, it looks spacious now, but you put five or six aircraft on here, it doesn't work so well. So that's part of the issue uh, at this airport. Um, the, it, it's, it's hard to see here. We have a better image of it uh, over here. But what happened in that time in aviation, just to give you an idea, back in 56, they were flying DC-7s and other aircraft like that. They carried 60 people or so over time. The aircraft grew. The DC-9 carried about 90 to 100 people. Early 737s were about 130 people. So by the time Terminal 2 was built in 98, um, you had 737s flying that were much bigger than those DC-7s, so that was designed for that. But now Southwest is not only flying a lot more aircraft than they thought at the time, but also they're flying much bigger aircraft. So we've gone from the 737, 300 or 700 model, it carried 130, 138 people. Now they're flying aircraft that are carrying 170 people. Plus they tend to be fuller in terms of uh, percent of seat occupied. So all those additional people are coming out of every gate go to all the restrooms, need to go through the corridors, need to go through the checkpoint. And it wasn't, the space wasn't designed for that. So it's all being kept up real well. It's cosmetically kept up. But when the function changes, you, you're kind of stuck with a building that can't accommodate all those changes. So as a result, you see the corridors there. Um, Concourse A, if you've ever flown United or Delta out of here, it's extremely tight at the mouth of it. It's, it's about 20 feet wide, and it goes to 75 feet. You'll see in a minute, modern concourses are more like 110. So you can tell right there, those are some of the issues that we're, we're looking at. So that's the existing condition. But we mentioned we're looking out 20 years. So when you project 20 years out, those issues only get worse. So we said, OK, let's develop a specific forecast for this airport. What is most likely to be your future demand that you have to accommodate? And you see the forecast here. You can see the COVID drop Rhonda mentioned you're doing much better than average airport in terms of your recovery because Southwest has been the most aggressive carrier in coming, coming back from this. So you can see that in your numbers and you're tracking on the forecast that uh, is almost two years old now. FAA approved this. So this is the official planning forecast for the airport. And the summary is, and we have this whole chapter on this, it's 100 and something pages of econometric analysis if you <laughs> want to read it. Um, and uh, you're looking at about 16 million passengers before COVID. By the time you recover, then you'll grow. You're looking at about 21 million passengers by 2040. And I say about because we know that forecasting is, you know, it's not a, it's not a science. Econometrics, you know, it looks like a science, but we just don't know what the future will hold. So we know that it might be 20 or 22 million. It might be off a few years, but we know roughly order of magnitude that's the level of passengers you're going to see in the future you need to be ready for. So that's what we're, what we're planning around. 
And when you take those numbers and you compare them against what's here today, how does that look? What are your shortfalls? Well, here are some of them. Growth in passengers means, means at least two things for your buildings. First of all, you need more gates. Uh, you have a bunch of gates today that are not quite usable, like the ones right here. Uh, they're here, you can't really use them suitably, so there's an, a, quite a bit of dead space in this building. Um, but the gates that are here need to be improved, but also you need about 10 more gates, so 62 total gates is really what you need. Same as space. Some of the space in here is not used, but if you look at the other terminal, if you've flown southwest, you know that building is bursting at the seams, needs about 400,000 square feet or so of additional space. So you need more space, you need more gates. In terms of the old and aging facilities, some of the decisions there are you could keep maintaining it, but still over time your maintenance costs are going to keep going up, especially if you want to keep things from breaking down, because that's the, the risk factor with old equipment. It, the risk of breakdowns become increases over time. Your maintenance costs just keep on going up. So if you did nothing, you tried to just keep everything going, you're talking about spending significant money. That makes sense. You think about an old house, I live in a very old house, or an old car, you know that the spending just goes up versus if you look at a new house, the utility bill is way lower and the air conditioner is not going to break next year because it's got a 20-year warranty on it. So the same philosophy applies to airports. Um, the other thing is uh, customer experience. When you have a 20-foot corridor or a big line at security, or you can't get from that concourse to that, so you're in concourse uh, A and you want to go grab a bite at that restaurant, you're like in concourse C, well, you can't get there because you're behind security in A. You'd have to come out of security, go back in security, go over there. It doesn't work. So that's another issue. Your security checkpoints, you have four at this airport. And the TSA doesn't like that either because they don't like to staff four different locations. So that's not really ideal. The other thing is concessions. When you have a narrow corridor, you, you can't put in more restaurant space without taking out restrooms. Well, actually, you need more restroom space because you have bigger aircraft. Well, we don't have room for more restrooms because if we need more restrooms, then we need to take it out of the hold room areas where people wait for the plane. Well, those are already too small, too. So you just can't expand anything in those existing corridors. You have to look at wider corridors, the, the whole concourse area. Um, more concessions, though, is good news, brings in more revenue. You know, people like concessions, they want to have a drink or a bite before they fly. Some of that money comes back to the airport, helps pay for the facilities. So that's the advantage of expanding with more concessions is it helps pay for what you're doing. Same with parking. Parking uh, is also a revenue producer for the airport, so that's the same thing. It helps pay for that improvement. To look at an example, um, you can see here the existing concourses and uh, what a typical new concourse looks like. And I'll just point out it real quick. This is A with that narrow corridor. This is the dome area. So we are about here. That concourse is not shown because it's not active, but it, you can see it on the aerial. It's right here. This is concourse C, and then this is the mothballed concourse. Of course, the metro station's here, and that is very important. It's very nice to have a metro access. This is what a typical concourse looks like. It's about 110 feet wide, lots of room for the restrooms, for the concessions, space in the corridor. You could even put a moving sidewalk in that. So that's kind of what airports are planning around these days. So you can just see that that's not anything you could accommodate with your existing facilities. So those are some of the problems. And next we looked at solutions. So for the terminal, we said, Let's not look at what's been looked at before and just start there. Let's zoom way out and say, what could you do? We looked at whole new areas on the airport. Could you go to the north side? Could you go to the west side, build a new terminal, build a new access? How would that work? You could do those things, but we ended up realizing that it would be cost prohibitive uh, to do that and that there were options to improve things in this footprint at a lower cost. So those options were looked at. They fell out. Uh, we looked at swapping the airlines. If Southwest is out of room, and I keep pointing over there, that's Terminal 2's over there. Um, if Southwest is out of room over there, well, bring them over here and then bring these airlines over there. It doesn't work because airlines here don't fit in that building either. So we looked at that, really wouldn't be the solution. The problem with Terminal 2 is that you're just out of room to do much over there. If you've been there, you know how tight it is. The highway's right there, the metro line's there, you're up against the airfield. There's not a lot of room to do things over there. So it comes down to, do you do one new or modernized terminal, or do you do two? And, and then where do you put them? So we, we looked at all the options, and in the end, it came out that two buildings, and this makes sense, again, when you think about a house or a car, you know, having two different facilities, even if they're new, versus just one larger one, 
the, the repetitive systems, checkpoints, bad claim units, all that stuff. Why have two separate ones when you can have one combined one that accommodates all the same facilities? It's more efficient. Again, the other downside of that Terminal 2 site is you just can't do it over there because there's not enough room to expand Terminal 2 as it is, let alone put the single terminal over there. So you kind of end up in this location. We looked at various options as to how you could do that over here. We looked at blowing up the domes. Just forget everything, start over. We also looked at keeping the domes and working with them. And in the end, there's really no advantage to blowing up the domes. That space actually works really well. The domes themselves are in great shape. That area can be reused very well. It's everything else like this or those concourses that are the issue. So we looked at fixing the concourses. Here's a, a, a diagram of what that could look like. I'll just point out it real quick. It's a little washed out, I'm sorry. We have better images of it on the stations. But so here's the dome area. Behind it is an area that's where that corridor is now. Would be a very large security checkpoint, a single checkpoint with plenty of lanes. You would co come through that, so you come straight in through the domes, through the checkpoint, out into the concourse, which would be right here. Um, it would be a long concourse, 110 feet wide, so plenty of room for all those facilities we talked about. And when you come in, you would come in like you do today and go to downstairs and come through bag claim and out. The road would be improved to be a typical stacked roadway. If you've been at other airports, typically the arrival and departure are above each other. It takes up less space. It's a little bit more logical than the kind of split level arrangement you have now. So it'd be a more modern roadway in front of the terminal. A little bit more about the roadways in a second. And then what you see here too is the taxiway system would be cleaned up a little bit to have less aircraft interference, so that would work a little smoother. And then around the back, you'd have full taxiways for aircraft to go in both directions. So nobody's blocking uh, another aircraft, which, you know, is. Um, the other thing is you see gates on both sides. If you look at Terminal 2 right now, the gates are on one side. And that means if you've got to go down the whole six gates, it doesn't sound too bad, but if they're all on one side, that's a pretty long walk. Whereas if you have gates on both sides, going down the hall three ga six gates means you just go three gates because they're on both sides. So the walking distances in a, in a concourse with gates on both sides are much better than on single loaded, as we call it. So that's what that is. And then what you see here, this is Terminal 2. Over time, Southwest would vacate that, move into the new terminal. The other airlines would be in there too. We'd phase this into existence. And then what would happen with that building, we're still trying to figure out, but it's a, it's a viable building. It's just not big enough for Southwest. So that building would stay, would become something else. There's a parking garage that's there that's also a perfectly fine garage. But we haven't sorted out yet exactly what to do over there. But all the airlines would be consolidated into one big remodel, redo of this building with an all new concourse you know, right here. So that's what that would look like. It's hard to see on a plan view. So here's a little bit of a cutaway that shows it more. And I'll point at sort of the departing and the arriving path that you would, you would take. New, bigger garage. You would come across the road, walk into the domes. I'm sorry, the domes are a little washed out on the screen, but those are the existing domes. The space under there would just be reconfigured. The elevator banks, the stairs and the escalators will come out, so it'd be a nice, open, clean space. The ticketing would be on one side, not on two sides, like it is today. The restaurant that's there would go away, so it'd be more usable space. And um, people would just walk through that. The checkpoint would be, as I mentioned, in the corridor area. So you'd come straight through the security checkpoint on the same level. You'd go straight out, and you'd be out in this big concourse. And you could go to any restaurant or coffee shop on that entire concourse because it's all one big, excuse me, one big open connected space. So a lot more options for passengers to wander around, get coffee, grab a bite at your favorite restaurant instead of the one that you're stuck with after security. Um, so the concessions I mentioned, the increase in space when we're looking at this kind of layout is almost 60% more concessions on the air side. So it gives you an idea of just how much more options there would be you know, to, to take a bite or get a drink before your flight. So that's what the, oh, and one last thing I want to point out real quick is the metro station right here. Uh, so that's out here by Concourse B. It's really nice that you have a rail connection to your airport. We want to keep that. It's in a perfectly fine location. So this plan leaves it where it is, and you keep access uh, to the met with the Metrolink. That's really nice to have. So that's it, kind of where we are with the terminal. Let's talk about the roads a little bit, because uh, I'm sure you've made a wrong turn somewhere on the roads here in the past. I know we have driving around this airport. It's just 
very difficult. There's very little distance to uh, make a decision. So if you're behind a truck and you can't, uh, can't see far ahead, then you may very well be in the wrong lane. So two examples. This is Terminal 1. Um, you can just see right here how tight this is. The interstate's right in front of your airport, and it's kind of the good news is the highway is nearby. The bad news is the highway is nearby. It's too close. Um, you come underneath, you have hundreds of feet. That's it. Uh, ideal distance is a mile, you'll see in a minute. So you have hundreds of feet to make decisions. What lane am I in? Where, where parking? Wait, and now you're going to the wrong terminal. Extremely tight. It's also dangerous. People weave and have to cut over at the last moment to get into the right lane. Not, not the ideal safety setup. Here's a, pictures from those two locations. The signs are here. You have maybe this distance to make a decision and get in that lane, and hopefully you're not behind a van or a truck. Same here. You come underneath this overpass. The signs there, and you literally have once you clear that overpass, you have about 75 feet to get in the right lane. That's just not uh, not how you should uh, have that. But that's how it's grown over time. The airport's done a great job of signage and, and paint markings on the road, so you have some chance of being in the right lane. But it's just not ideal. So we're looking at fixing that. Terminal two is more recent, but it has grown much more. So you have the same kind of problem there. Um, you can see that the site there is very tight. Here again is the interstate, parking garage, terminal. There is no room. Uh, there's a line through here. That's the Metrolink line. It's really nice to have that, but the problem is it sits on big columns, so you, you can only put the road you know, in certain locations, clearing those columns, so that really boxes you in. Um, and so there's not a lot of room. Same thing here. This is the arrivals level. If you've flown southwest, this is probably what you saw, the arrivals curve. There's only two lanes here. Typical, typical setup is four lanes. So right away, this shows you what you would think is that you don't have enough space there. When you come out of this area, once you've picked up grandma and you're coming out of there like, okay, now we're going home, this is the only distance you have to be in the correct lane. So uh, it's about, I think it's about 100 feet and you need to decide Terminal 1, I-70 one way or I-70 the other way. And if, if you're behind a big blacked out SUV, you're in the wrong lane. You're going the wrong way on the interstate. Not ideal, but again, there's no space to fix it. So what we're looking at is in the ideal airport roadway <laughs> system. And I know this is ideal. You, a lot of airports don't have this, but it's good to know, okay, wh what, is, what are we trying to achieve? What would be ideal to have? It's this setup. About a mile, you come off the interstate, you have a mile, you slow down, you know you're on the airport. Stress level goes down, terminal's over there, I have a sign up there, plenty of space, no weaving. First sign is maybe for uh, general aviation or cargo or gas station or um, long-term parking. You keep driving another sign, one decision at a time, short-term parking, terminal, this terminal, that terminal. Plenty of space to make these decisions one at a time. That's the ideal setup. And that ideally, you'd like to have about a mile for that to work optimally. Of course, issue here is you're a little bit close to the freeway. So we looked at, OK, we can't move the airport. Can we move the interstate? Well, not really. So that's marked out. The other thing is, can you look at the roads that are service roads to the freeway, to the interstate, and make them one way and kind of get access that way? Well, you could, but that doesn't work for the surrounding communities. You'd completely cut off their roadway system. So that doesn't work. So then what remains is, okay, you got to get that distance. How do you somehow fit that in there? We, I mentioned we're starting with a larger garage, so there'll be a larger loop road around that. And now the question is, how do you tie into that? And we're not quite done yet with the options. We're talking to MoDOT. We're talking to the surrounding communities to make sure we make it all work for them. But essentially, here's kind of the options we're looking at. So this is, again, today that really short distance uh, on air flight drive underneath the freeway, underneath Lindbergh, and then boom, you're there. So we're looking at could you have more use of an entrance over here and have a bit of distance here to get that, maybe not a mile, but get a distance. Same here. Could you do more here and have a loop feeding into this to get a little bit of distance, to have those one decision at a time situations? So that's what we're looking at right now. Again, we're not quite done yet. We do have our senior transportation planner here who can answer more questions, but we're talking to the communities down here Bridgeton, Woodson Terrace, and others to make sure we're tying into their roads and their future roads to make sure we're not cutting anybody off. So we're still sorting that out. But that's the way to look at it. You can't do it vertically. Well, you do it horizontally. And it looks like there's several options to make it work. 
Next, let's talk about the airfield and our partners at CMT have done this work. And normally at airports, this is a much bigger deal, but you're in great shape when it comes to the airfield. Your runway length is adequate for all kinds of long haul service. Uh, you've got Lufthansa starting next month. Um, we looked at capacity, the ability to have throughput, number of aircraft movements. You have plenty of capacity with third runway. So your airfield is in, in great shape. So the only thing you see here, if you have any questions or if you're a pilot and you're interested in this, Doug, uh, the CMT can talk more about this, but is simple updates to the standards that FAA puts out. Just like the highway standards, always improving uh, the, the planning to make the highway safer and less confusing. It's the same with airfields. So that's what some of these improvements are you see in blue, minor taxiway improvements that have safety benefits that will be done over time. But nothing earth shattering with uh, the runway. We don't have time to get into details tonight on some of the other facilities on the airport, but I'll, I just did want to mention that we are looking at these things. And I'm talking about cargo, general aviation, corporate activity, as well as um, all these support functions that exist on the airport. Everything from the fire rescue facility to the maintenance uh, of the airfield and, and uh, facilities like that. So we have to have space for all those. We talked to a lot of the tenants. We projected space that they might need in the future. And we reserved areas on the airfield for that. So all the tenants will be able to grow over time. There's areas reserved uh, for them. So I'll just leave it at that. And I'll get to this topic, which you're probably wondering about, which is, OK, this is great. But what's this going to cost? And how are we going to pay for this? So first, um, how this works in aviation. Aviation is a closed loop system. Except for some of the tiniest general aviation airports uh, that need subsidy, uh, all other airports in the US pay their own way, both in operation um, as well as when you do capital improvements. So it doesn't come out of city coffers, even though it's a city department, it's kind of a separate fund. FAA watches is like a hawk, so this is uh, how this works in this country. It's a very good system. Some of the sources of revenue for um, capital improvements include, if you've bought a ticket, you've seen all those taxes. Some of those taxes go into a big fund in Washington, D.C., and you know, when you have approved projects, they give you some of that money back as an airport to use it for some of the, the projects. There's another fee on there called the passenger uh, facility charge. It's, at most airports, it's 450 which you get charged per, per flight or per leg. That money gets collected and goes into a fund that has to go back to improvements. It can't be used for anything else. So that's another source of money. And then airports can issue bonds where you can take that money and do bonds. And as long as you pay the bonds, you can leverage your funds. Just like when you do a mortgage on a house, you can get much more money for a particular important project anytime and fund it with those other sources. Parking, concessions, airline rents, charges, there's fuel flowage fees. All those fees are based on what it costs to run the airport and what it costs to do these capital programs. That's how it works at all airports. That's how it works here. This airport's financially independent from the city. Um, but we said, okay, that's great, but we still need to make sure that this makes sense at the gut check level of what is this gonna cost. So we did some very high level costing. We looked at it per square foot, per gate, uh, and we looked at what other airports were doing. Um, to make sure we, not, we were not missing something. And you can see the numbers here. If you just look at the terminal, you're talking about 30, 31, 32 million dollars per gate. It's a lot of money, but it's in line with other airports around the country. If you add in parking and roads and some of the other improvements, um, and parking is always interesting because it pays its own way. Uh, but when you add all that up, it's, it's more like 40 to 44, 45 million per gate, again, big numbers, but if you look at other airports around the country, it's right in what everybody else is having to spend. That means it's affordable. If you can do it at other airports at the same activity levels, the airlines are used to these types of costs and projects. So this is not out of whack. It's not to say we have final costs and we have anybody signing on a dotted line for the program just yet. That comes in the future. But that's part of what we will do is a little bit more analysis on the cost but there'll be other phases after this master plan that'll look at the cost even more. I'll talk about the next steps here on this slide. So we're talking about this plan and we're, we're starting to wrap it up. It's still preliminary because we wanna hear what, what you all think. We're gonna consider all that input. But once we finish the plan here in the summer, late summer, there are several other steps. This effort will be done it will be bridging documents, which is a term for a, um, preliminary engineering where you develop more details so you can do more financial analysis and you can do environmental analysis. There will be an environmental uh, assessment that FAA will review and approve. That will take about a year. 
uh, and that's where you get approval uh, from FAA to build the facility, or you get questions and you, you need to go back to square one because it has to be justified, the impacts have to be mitigated. Only then do you go to architectural design. Architects brought on, they take all this, refine it, argue about the roof and all those things and what it's gonna look like, the interior, and that's when you really have the final cost. And that's typically where the airport makes a deal with the airlines, because the airlines will rent the facility, they have to pay for that. So that's when a business deal is struck, and then you have a solid financial footing at that point. And we just need to make sure that we continue looking at the financial feasibility so when we get to design, there's no surprises. But that's about where we are with our process, and this tells you what's coming up. So we're about, if you're wondering, we're about four to six years away from construction. And then construction itself would take quite a while because you're building in an existing area, of course. Last thing I wanted to just mention real quick is the airport's project manager over this, Dana Ryan, is very knowledgeable about the airport and our process, and this is his email and phone number. So we're not just giving you a voicemail box or some you know, uh, generic email address that goes somewhere. This is the project manager himself. Feel free to, to call Dana. We're here, of course, tonight, but afterwards, at any time, his, his, his uh, info has been on the website the whole time. There's a lot of information on the website. I mentioned the forecast, econometrics, 150 pages, uh, highly recommended. Um, so there's a lot of information out there. So that's where we are. Uh, I hope that gave you a bit of an overview and then we have time for Q&A and we'll stay here until the end for the, uh, the information stations to talk further as needed. So thank you. Thank you, John. And again, um, and that's a lot to throw at, at you in a 30 minute window. Uh, I hope everybody understands the comprehensive teamwork and exercise. Um, we've been working on this for over two years. So this is not a project that's pulled together in 30 days or three months. Uh, it's been a project that's been a lot of people engaged with uh, for the last two and a half years. So we are happy to, to answer questions that you may have. And please don't be shy. We're used to it. Thank you so much, John. I know that was a lot of information, a process, so you can see all the cameras in the back. We're recording this, so we'll be online on the airport's website early next week. So you can tell your friends and neighbors and, and others who could not make it tonight that they can view this presentation and give input. Who has a question at this time? I also wanted to point out just before we get to a question, so you, you, you heard um, John's presentation, you heard him talk about all the partnerships we have. MoDOT obviously is a critical piece of this because 70 runs right in front of our airport. So Tom Blair's uh, here this evening. Tom has been a great partner with us in looking at how do we mirror these, how are we able to improve that system both from the highway, the interstate onto our boulevard. So, those are the types of partnerships that are another critical piece of this. So, Tom, thank you for coming out. I also saw uh, one of our airport commissioners here. Obviously, that is a team. I think uh, Rick Nimanak from our, one of our commissioners um, is here this evening. Oh, and uh, that's right. I'm sorry. And Justin King, one of our new commissioners. So, uh, obviously, they're also a critical piece of helping us guide sort of the future of this airport. So, thank you both for coming out. Question. You, you had on your timeline four to six years to start construction. How long do you think to, to till you can finish the construction? If we if we look at this project, um, and we've talked about this a lot, you're probably looking at close to a 10-year window starting from now until 100% completion if we move forward with this project. So when you think about you know, there's a lot that has to be done. You've got a garage that gets relocated. You've got a terminal roadway system. You have the terminal itself that has to be built in sections. So, you know, it's another piece of why we think we need to start talking about this in a more serious fashion, because it is a decade-long project. Anyone else? There's one over here. You're going to make me get my steps in today, <laughs> which all of us got walking down this Hallway. Hello, yes. Um, we were promised a terminal on the far west end of this expansion years and years ago, and it never developed. Is that still a possibility? 
I, I think what you're, you know, a master plan, there have been a, there's been master plans done every decade or so here. That's a requirement. And so if you go back to master plans that were done in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or the last one was 2012, there were a number of options that were in those. One of those um, was a separate terminal across the field. I think you heard John talk about the challenges with that from a roadway perspective. You have to have major interstates coming into your airport. John, did you want to add anything? Yeah, that, that was an alternative that we looked at, but this is a, a more efficient uh, setup that we ended up with. So we did look at all those options again, including all, all the way on the north side of the airport, bringing all new access into it. Um, but you're starting you know, from scratch with something like that versus there's something to, be, to start from here. So in the end, those things become cost prohibitive. Any other questions? There's a gentleman there. Yeah, I know there was some discussion earlier or a while back of expanding the baggage claim area at Terminal 2. Would this potentially affect that project since we'd be building a new terminal here and then just demolishing what we just built over there? Or is that are we still going to work on that since it's we've got that time there? Yeah, we're in negotiations um, with our partner at Terminal 2 on that. So, uh, you know, if we embark on this project, Terminal 2 in Southwest would be the last to move into this terminal because they wouldn't have a Terminal 2 until the very end. So if you think about that window of how long that might be, we still would like to look at increasing the baggage opportunities for Terminal 2. So we're in the midst of, we, we had an agreement and then of course COVID came and everything changed and so now we're working with them again to look at that, but we would hope that we could do something in the very short future. Any other questions? If not, let me, and then I'll come back to you. Um, most major airports have a separate uh, car rental facility. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You, you heard John speak of a number of different opportunities to repurpose some of these. So while it's not a specific plan in this, there are areas where we could look at what we call a CONRAC. It's a consolidated car rental facility. Um, so that is one of the ideas that's out there as other uses for some of the other areas that were identified. Uh, I think the focus right now for us is to really educate the public on the need and the challenges we're facing from a cost perspective on the existing terminals and what we're going to be spending on those in the future and still facing the challenges that we're going to face with separate terminals, roadway systems, all these different checkpoints, all that's inefficient. But yes, that is something that is being considered as one of the options for some of those other areas that will be available. Yes, uh, I attended a meeting at Drummond Elementary. It was in St. Anne. This was several years ago. And FEMA was there, Federal Emergency Management. And they talked about this facility as a retention area for uh, refugees and immigrants. As a matter of fact, when Katrina hit, the hurricane, they were going to put 50,000 people in those McDonnell Douglas hangars. Is this still considered an area for that immigration uh, retention? So there's a couple of things. Uh, while that was set up, it was never occupied back then. So it was a potential site. Um, we also uh, had in the past the potential site set up in the Missouri Air National Guard, which has been vacant. It's not been utilized for any of that. So, you know, it's not a process where you would put that into your planning as a potential site because our primary purpose obviously is for passengers and cargo. So because that facility was on the field, it was looked at as a potential, but it never was utilized. We have a question here. Yes, uh, quick question. People movers, uh, I don't see that was included, or uh, universal language and signs, more of them. Right. Uh, I think when you say people mover, we would normally call that moving sidewalk. Is that what you move? Yeah, okay. Um, the, the, the nice thing about the width that we talked about, 110 feet uh, for the concourse, is that it allows that down the center. So that would be provided uh, for people to go in both directions. Um, in terms of signs and signage, you know, the, the, the number one thing about wayfinding oh, is not the sign, it's the logical layout of the facility. If it's the right layout, you kind of know where to go and signs help. If you have a very strange facility that 
people go in unexpected directions and level changes. You need lots of science. So that starts with trying to lay it out as simply and efficiently as possible. During architectural design, which is some years away, is where you would get into the specific specifics of signage uh, and making sure that there's you know digital signs and everything is as clear as, as possible. It's a little early for that, but this would certainly be an easier facility for anybody to, to find their way around, I think. Universal. Pardon, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Universal, Universal yeah. signage. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and a lot of airports are also adopting something that was started by my hometown airport in, in Amsterdam with a certain type of signage and symbolism that airports are adapting in yellow signs. That Denver is adapting this, for example, or adopting this now, that where you can more easily find your way around. Everybody knows what those signs mean, especially international travelers. So that is coming and becoming more popular. So by the time you get to architectural design, I'm sure that will be on the table as an option. And those are those details that you get in down the road if indeed the project moves forward. So, but that's the type of input we want from people. Yeah. That type of feedback at the what you'd like to see if we think about this project and you think about the importance as a, an individual of what's important to you. All of that feedback is critically important for us so that if we do move with this project, we at least are considering the needs of everybody. We have one last question over here. Yeah, with the rumors going around, you know, through the past couple of years, rumors about this the airport being privatized, would that is this with this ten year plan, would it is this still gonna be possibly privatized in ten years? Or is that off the table? That's off the table. I think uh, Mayor Jones has been vocally adamant, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she's been very adamant that privatization is not something she wants to look at. So that project is no longer on the table. And I think embarking on something like this where we're engaging all of the community and all of our airlines to build, uh, if we decide to do that, what we want is something that the region can come to a conclusion together versus a private operator. Thank you very much for being here and your questions. John, Rhonda, and the rest of the team, anyone who has a name badge on can answer your questions at the station. But thanks so much for being here. Don't forget that the presentation will be on the airport website if you want to tell your friends, neighbors, and family. Thank you, and have a great evening. Yes, sir. It's not on, I don't think, is it? Okay, we talked about, you talked about community engagement, and you said that you met with us three times. The first time we met with you, we were trying to type in questions and stuff, and you just ignored us and shut the meeting off. The second time, we talked about how everything was on the north, east, and west was going to benefit financially, but the people on the south were going to be burdened because you couldn't get anything done if we can't get, get to, to what we needed to get to. We have a tunnel project that was built under, started on it because everybody said it was so dang hard to get in and out of the thing. And I've spent a half a million dollars on this and we've worked on it considerably longer than what you've worked on. And now we kind of are thrown back on the plan just as an afterthought. Because the second time I, after I pointed this out to you, you threw it back on the plan. But then when you mailed us the documents about today, we were off it again. And I talked to the gentleman over there, and he said that, no, we're not off it. So we don't know what's going on. I'm not sure I understand what he's speaking to, but. The tunnel. Yeah. The, the, the Lindbergh Tunnel? Yeah, the, the tunnel. We're aware of your project, and uh, Dan here, who is with our uh, local transportation planning group, can talk more about it, but that is part of uh, our looking at the options. We're talking to MoDOT. We need to have further discussions with your community so we don't cut anybody's roads off, existing or planned. And that's part of why we didn't show a final roadway plan is because it's not final. Well, and I think, you know, it's important to, you know, our effort in this whole exercise is to bring the community in, not to shut the community off. So looking at all these different options, trying to make sure that we bring more access is critically important. I mean, I think everybody understands the challenges that we face with our roadway system and having 
the Interstate 70 right next to it. It's a benefit that you can get right off the interstate into it, but as, as you heard from John, there's a lot of challenges with that. So obviously there's been tons of coordination with MoDOT as well on this, and you're gonna continue to have to, so coordinate that. So it's the, the intent is not to cut off access, it's to make sure that we can have more access into our neighboring communities. So continue to provide that feedback. Again, these plans are ongoing. But we want those concerns. I mean, we know that things are important to our neighboring communities. So listening to that feedback, ultimately we'll have to look at what fits and what makes the most sense. And, I, and we do appreciate that. Um, what I would like to emphasize, because in this presentation we talked a lot about, you talked a lot about Highway 70 as your goal. Get to, quickly get to Highway 70. And then access getting onto the airport. Access. There are different ways to get onto the airport and to leave the airport. It shouldn't just be Highway 70. The goal shouldn't just be to get on Highway 70 and get out of town. We thrive on connectivity between the community and the airport, and not just what's in Paris, but you know Berkeley and, and Kinloch that suffered greatly in, in the last um, you know master plan process of, of the airport. So you know I really just want to remind everybody that's working on this that access is going both ways. And, and that we want, it's not just we want access to the airport, we want people that are coming into the airport and our businesses to have access in both directions. Mm -hmm. Understood, you know, we understand that. And I think, you know, one of the things you have to look at is, is across the country in, pers in perspectives to access, you've gotta have easy access into the airport. That's absolutely critical for the survivability of the airport. But that doesn't take away access into the surrounding neighborhoods. So I, I think both of those have to play a key role into looking at the future. Is this related in any way to the talk earlier about uh, privatizing and letting a company manage the airport? Because we haven't talked about that. And then the other thing, um, are we doing this mostly for Southwest because they're outgrowing their footprint down there? What about the other airlines? So I'll answer your first question. This has nothing to do with privatization. So that was a project that the prior administration had looked to. Um, Mayor Cruson at the time called that off in December of 19, if I'm remembering correctly. I think Mayor Jones has made it very clear that she's not interested in privatizing the airport. So this process has nothing to do with that. We are required, as you heard, to do a master plan. Whether we implement this master plan and move forward has not been made as a decision, but we as an airport are required to coordinate with the FAA and do this so that we can look to the future. They understand the needs of airports all across the country, and that helps them budget for future costs and expenses and where that role they will play. So this has nothing to do with privatization. On the second question, this isn't just about Southwest. We've been growing with a lot of different carriers here. You heard me talk about Lufthansa coming in this summer first time in over 20 years we've had continental Europe service. That's a big deal. And I think, um, you know, spending a lot of time with Lufthansa right now, they're very happy with what they're seeing on the bookings. And so I think, you know, having that service back is a critical piece to the strategic plan of this region and how we're viewed globally, not just domestically, but globally around the world. We also have brought in carriers like Spirit and Frontier. So Spirit's new, they just came in the last year ultra low cost carriers that are typically bringing in new people. They're not just stealing from each other. Somebody used to fly this airline, now they're flying this one. They really bring in new people. And, and we serve this region, 2.8 million is our MSA. But we have people drive from Cape Girardeau, from Joplin. You know, Springfield has some limited air service, but we get people from all around the state and on the Illinois side as well that come in. So. The, the one challenge that we have with Southwest is that connecting traffic. So Southwest is a little over 50% of our airport. So if you think about 16 million passengers in 2019, and we'll get there next year, I think we'll exceed that, that's eight million people that flew on Southwest. Of that, 32% were connecting people that came through this airport. If you didn't have that connecting traffic, you would have 20, 25% less flights out of this airport. So when Southwest started growing that connecting traffic, which was really 2015, 2016, we had put together, had been working with them for a plan to lower our costs 
to be more competitive, to sell our airport as an asset, and how they could connect in here and through here efficiently and cost effective, they started growing that traffic. And in five years, that traffic has doubled on the connecting side. In 2015, it was 17%. It's now 32, 33% of the Southwest traffic. And we can grow that more, but that is very hard to grow in Terminal 2. And the reason for that is they have 35 or 40 minute connecting times. That's their model. So if I'm getting on an airplane that's full, and every airplane's full these days, you have to deplane. That's a 15 or 20 minute exercise. Depends if people have bags and kids and everything else. And then if I'm coming in at E4 and I have to walk to E40, I've got to do that all in 35 or 40 minutes. That's just getting to be a real challenge. So when we think about a project like this, when we think about the future, it encompasses all that. It brings the growth of Southwest from that connecting standpoint. We talk about international. So, you know, the Lufthansa flight. Uh, for those of you who were here in the TWA days, we used to have an international arrival area here in this airport, actually kind of just underneath us um, on the sea concourse. It, it's been closed for two decades. Even if we wanted to reopen it, it would not begin to meet today's standards or could we reopen that. So our international arrival area is in Terminal 2, where Southwest is. So, you know, Lufthansa is going to have to depart and arrive out of Terminal 2. Carriers today who are in Terminal 1, like Frontier and Spirit and even American was doing the Cancun flight on weekends, they have to bring that airplane into Terminal 2, clear customs, and then tow that airplane off to come over here to depart. So when you think about a project like this, you look at a large, unified, not only a checkpoint, where you go from four checkpoints, a lot of manpower, duplication of, of uh, X-ray equipment, the same with the FIS. You can bring in one large consolidated FIS that's in one terminal that has the benefit of all the carriers. So it absolutely was not designed for one carrier. It was designed for the plethora of carriers that we have and the carriers that we're growing with. What's the FIS? Oh, I'm sorry. Federal Inspection Services. So if you're an international passenger coming in from Europe or Caribbean or, or uh, any of the Mexican cities, you have to clear the international arrivals area. Um, Canada, you pre-clear in Canada. So the flights that we have, which are also coming back this week, starting tomorrow, we're so excited, Toronto's coming back, um, they clear in Canada. But all of the Caribbean destinations, all at Lufthansa, you have to go through customs when you arrive here at, you know, in the States. And so that's what the international arrival area is. Thank you. I'm an eternal optimist, and I'm looking at the way you're, you're, uh, you've laid that out. Is there any room for, let's say, another hub if we were to become a hub at some particular point in the future? So, you know, I answer this question a lot. What I tell people all the time is, and remember my, my background was with TWA. I ran this hub for many years um, and ultimately ran their North American operations. But TWA put all of their eggs in the basket here. So when we, ran, when we had this, we were TWA's only hub after 1986, after they purchased Ozark Airlines, everything came here. That meant that 70% of their traffic connected through this hub. So the local market that we had is the same as we had 25, 30 years ago. The local market, we actually exceeded just by a little bit the local market, but it was because of all of that connecting traffic moving through here. So when you think about what's happened with the legacy carriers and how they've morphed, places like Cincinnati had a Delta hub, Pittsburgh had a hub, you had Memphis that had a hub, Nashville had a hub, we had a hub. All of those have disappeared in these mid-sized markets. And it's because the legacy carriers like the Americans and Uniteds and Deltas have consolidated and they're pushing those hubs into markets of 10, 12, 15, 20 million people because that O&D is a critical piece. 70% connecting traffic really is very challenging financially for an airline to make that successful. That being said, really when you think about the Southwest and the size of Southwest, they are exceeding 100 flights a day. In the eyes of an industry, 100 flights a day is a hub at any airport. Now Southwest doesn't call themselves hubs. They have a different model. They look at a point where we have large cities where we operate more point to point and bring some connecting traffic through. So I think it's a different type of hub, but we do have a hub. 
and you know, continuing to grow not only that piece of our operation, but all the pieces of the various airlines. You know, I think if, if you think about getting back to you know, our peak year uh, was 30 million passengers. We're back to 16. You saw our growth plan gets us to 21. Do I think we could ever get back to 30? I think that depends if this region continues to grow and move in the right direction. But you can't rely on 70% of traffic coming through here to be viable. It just is a model that's really challenging to work in today's aviation system. Oh, do you have enough offering to? Regarding the, the surrounding communities, and my representation is 40 municipalities. Uh, we, when you had the W1W or whatever that, you know, it, it, it decimated Kenlock, you know, to some degree. And now we have, you know, municipalities on the other side of 70. And we just really want, I'm going to trust you at your word that you're going to really make sure that, that, that they are not cut off. Because once you cut off that, eco that economic viability, is not there. And so we, we need to make sure that, that, that we do that and make sure that those communities are made whole and are part of the process. So that's going to mean a little bit more uh, community outreach, <laughs> if you will, so that they feel a part of the process. That's, that, that's my question. That's my Absol absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing that we, we really didn't mention and we probably should have, as we're you saw all of that we're talking about. That's within the existing perimeter of what we have today. That is not buying any more land. That's not taking any more homes or households. That was the project that was with our runway expansion. And I know, you know, a lot of people feel that was not a viable project or the project, but it has, it has afforded us the opportunity to think about a magnificent runway system and really be competitive, I think, for the future. So, but this project that we're talking about is within our existing parameters. There is no additional land purchase that's, that's necessary for this. And I think that's a critical piece for people to understand. The other piece is, I will tell you, we have doubled our cargo in the last five years. So last year, we ended up with 251 million pounds of cargo coming through this airport. In 2016, we had about 125 million. So we have doubled cargo. And I think if you think about our airport, it's not just for passengers, it's for the whole logistics of the center of the United States, which as a state, we're really trying to focus on that, trying to focus on air, rail, road, and waterway systems. So when you think about the multimodal aspect that we can tie into the greater logistics piece in this region, that's critical for this future of this airport. And we can do that. We can grow the air car. It was an opportunity back in the day when we didn't need air cargo. We were busting at the seams and we really didn't even want cargo. It's a much different environment today, the global readiness around the world to have to move product and, and you know to and from not only coast to coast, but all around the world. Air cargo is a growing commodity and it's gonna continue, especially when you see the challenges with the seaports. So I think that's another piece that we can't forget about is how valuable cargo is. And when we talk to these cargo carriers, we also are approved now as a USDA live animal facility, so we've been carrying a lot of the live animal charters. Those are very unique, and those are buying product here from the Midwest and growing livestock in other countries. So they're buying cattle, they're buying hogs, they're shipping them into these other markets, and it's not for slaughter, it's to grow that protein for their people and to be able to really enhance their stock. So that's a piece that we're now approved for as well, and we've seen a number of those shipments. Maybe they're gone into uh, Santiago, Chile, or into, um, um, I'm trying to think of the other place. Brazil, into, yeah, into, thank you, <laughs> into Brazil. So that's a growing commodity, and we are so positioned to be able to take advantage of that, which there's so few airports in the country that are. So let's think of our airport not just as an economic engine in terms of passengers, but what we can be in the broader multimodal as well. Any other questions? Can, real quick, can I clarify O and D? Oh. We, we use lots of jargon in our industry. O and D means origination or destination. In other words, local traffic versus connecting traffic. Just Sorry about that. We use a lot of acronyms. <laughs> You've already uh, partially addressed this question, and that's about the newer Bridgeton runway. A lot of people consider it to have been under underutilized so far and never having lived up to its potential. So I'm assuming that with this... Uh, um, uh, big picture project with the uh, uh, concourses and so on that it, 
the runway will consider to eventually live up to its potential that it was that was envisioned in the first place? Absolutely, and I think you know it, it's twofold. Again, cargo has to be a piece of that as we think about becoming a bigger piece of the air cargo. If you look out this window right now, you'll see one of our runways, one of our parallels, is, is all dug up. Um, a lot of construction, as, as you heard, we have to, with the FAA, their primary is that our runways are in the safest condition. So we get 75% federal funds on most of those projects. That's a six-month project this year, and then it's a six-month project next year. So during that project, guess what? That new runway keeps us opening at 100% of our capacity plus. So I know, I know the angst that it came for a lot of people in this region. I know that. Um, but I think let's look to the future. Let's think about how we, can, how we can utilize that. Let's think about what it means for this region in terms of being able to grow that multimodal as well as continuing to try to grow the passenger traffic. I will, you know, I'll be the first to say building a new airport doesn't bring people. But what it does is it sets you to the future and it helps you in terms of growing that connecting traffic. And while you're doing that, if we think about where our region's growing, you think about some of the, the today's environment where you have people moving off those coasts and coming more back to the Midwest because they can, they can work anywhere in the world. I think there's a good, good chance that we're going to see a population growth here over the next decade as well. So then you can move that number up in terms of your local market. Can I add one thing about the runway? And again, CMT's Doug Gregory's over here to talk more about the airfield if you have any other questions. But I would mention that your current two runways are too close together to be used independently during bad weather. In good weather, it's not an issue. Everybody has good visibility. But the, one of the reasons behind that new runway was to get a runway that was far enough away from your other runway, not the one that's closed now, but the other one, to get them far enough apart so that you could have independent operations. In other words, you could keep flying the full airline schedule at a safe distance during bad weather, a day like today. So. That's a competitive advantage because if you don't have that and you have dependent runways, weather goes bad, the airlines are canceling flights or there's lots of delays. So you still, it may not be used as much uh, as uh, anticipated, but it still gives you an advantage during bad weather. You have an independent airfield, which means low delay. It's good for cargo, good for the airline. So it's still a, it's still a plus. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, two quick questions to ask. Um, as time goes by with this project, will there be more open, uh, open meetings like this? And second, what can you tell us so far regarding of how airlines and concessions have already responded to this? Has there been a mix of emotions? Have they expressed concern of any operational impact or interruptions? Is there something that you can tell us about that? Sure. So there will be more open houses. Uh, we don't have the next one scheduled yet. We wanted to see what the response was tonight. Uh, for those of you who might have uh, come in, we had a full house on the first one, so that was great. We think this format worked good. We wanted people to come out to the airport because what better way to talk about than airport than having people in your airport. So I, I think, yes, Adam, we will do more open houses. There certainly is also, um, you can scan, uh, there's QR codes you can give us feedback. We're tracking all of that, we're putting it into a database so that not only can we share with the public the feedback we're getting, but we know as we move on with this, if we move forward, what are people saying, what do we need to be concerned about, so yes. And then to answer your question relative to the airlines, obviously we can't do this project if the airlines aren't supportive of it. So they're a big piece of all along the way. I will tell you that all of the airlines have agreed that a single preferred terminal is the concept that we should look to if we do something. Doesn't mean they've agreed to sign that bottom line and say, yes, we want to do this. But they have agreed that a single terminal concept works best. And if you look at airports around the country, you know, that's, wherever, that's what everybody's going to. So I think uh, we have their support in doing that. Obviously, pen to paper and negotiations will be a key piece of the next two years as we work through. In terms of thinking about not only our current concessions, because we are trying to open up a couple more things, we know that we're leaving money on the table. We know that people want more concessions, and it's challenging, as you heard in this project, to try to build those. So we're trying to squeeze a couple in in some different locations. But if you think about as we move forward, you know, the concessions, uh, 
I think the concessionaires are all excited because they'd have an opportunity to expand, whether it's with existing concession or whether it's a new concessionaire in a new airport. I mean, you have to go through a lot of processes to go through RFPs, uh, requests for proposals as we think about a new terminal. But I think the opportunity for our concessionaires is doubled uh, by looking at a concept, which means not only do their revenues enhance, our revenues enhance. So if you think about parking, you know, we own the two garages and five lots today. Um, that's over $30 million uh, we in net annual revenue for the airport in terms of parking. So being able, we know we get complaints every day. You don't have enough parking, you need more parking. I know, I answer them every day. Um, being able to have a garage that's almost twice the size and the revenue that it can generate is substantial. So yeah, good question. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's looking at how do we try and bring every partner here into the fold so that it works for everybody going forward if we go this route? Anyone else? I don't think so. Well, we'll, well be will <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ryan. That's all right. That will wrap it up. Uh, you notice the cameras. We are videotaping the presentation. So the presentation will be online starting next week. We have neighbors, friends, colleagues who couldn't make it tonight and are interested in in this planning process, then tell them to go to the airport website and you, they can view the presentation and leave feedback. And we have a few more minutes. Anyone with the badge, the station at our boards can answer any other questions you may have. So thank you for being here this evening and your interest in the airport. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Have a good evening.